here. Um, I'm excited to introduce Matt Christensen today. I've known Matt since he was at least in high school, probably a little before. It's, it's been a long time. I've had the pleasure of working him, uh, with him directly when he was a student at K-State. Matt is well known to many of us uh, who are in the learning disabilities community. He is sometimes uh, with his mom, he, and sometimes with his mom, who's in the audience here. Let me just give a little wave. Uh, has been a speaker for years in many groups uh, in, in our state of Kansas and probably elsewhere as well. I got to know Matt when we were both involved uh, in the Learning Disabilities Association. Matt was a student spokesperson. There was another name for that, but I can't remember what it was. Student advocate. Student advocate. Mm -hmm. LBA. Uh, this is much in his much younger days. Uh, he spoke at many conferences. <laughs> he, went to many, he, went to, he went to many schools. He spoke to many uh, K-12 students, um, college students, and families. He talked about his learning disabilities, how he has coped, and how it has shaped his life. Well, he's no longer in high school. He's still talking to groups. He has helped, I bet, literally him and both his mom, thousands and thousands and thousands of students and families um, regarding um, uh, living with a learning disability. And, um, and I know that he will change your life today as well. So join me in welcoming you. Well, all right, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, let me adjust my mic for a second. It's kind of high. It's kind of getting loud. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, as uh, Andrea said, I teach AP American History and Sociology to juniors and seniors at Blue Valley Northwest. So I teach about 150 kids every day, and I have the greatest job in the world. Uh, and the reason I have the greatest job in the world is because I have the opportunity to tell a story all day long. And there's nothing better than a story. My kids eat it up. It's what, what drives me is the idea of a story, hearing a story. It's a collective idea that people belong to. And so I, because I have that opportunity to do that, I brought today with you a little bit of a story. Um, we're going to start off talking about the story of my life and how um, I got here today to talk to you. And then we'll talk a little bit about what that means um, as I've changed my life over the course of time from being a student with learning disability to now being a teacher learning disability and how that kind of shapes how and what I do. So I grew up in a small town in Stewart, Iowa, which I don't know if you know anything about growing up in a small town, but that small town had about 1,600 people in it. So with 1,600 people in that town, it's pretty small. Um, and everybody in a small town plays a really important role. Well, it's like a high sound's killing me. Let me turn this down just a hair. So no, keep buzzing out. <coughs> Okay. Turn this down just a bit. See if I can turn this on. You still hear me? Mm -hmm. That's a little bit better, not so much feedback. So, uh, I grew up in a small town, and my family was unique because my family's all about um, holding an important position in that small town. Everybody in a small town plays a really important job. So, my dad was a town veterinarian in the small agricultural community, and um, he's a really smart guy. Um, my dad got his undergraduate degree from Iowa State University. He went on to get his master's degree from Iowa State University, uh, and then got his doctorate degree from Iowa State University um, in veterinary medicine. And his master's in, is in swine epidology, uh, the diseases of pigs. So I know you're like, that's awesome, right? Like, who doesn't want to talk to that guy? Um, so that's my dad. And then there's my mom, who was an important person in that community because she was a teacher. Uh, she had been a long-standing teacher. She still is a teacher. She just kind of oozes out of that like teacher nest that kind of just travels around with her. You can kind of tell she's a teacher, um, which is awesome. And my mom got her undergraduate uh, undergraduate degree from Iowa State University and went on to get her a master's degree. Uh, and as I said, it's a big time teacher. So growing up in this family, you can imagine we're all about learning. We're all about education. We're all about doing things that are learning based. So my childhood was just kind of weird because it wasn't the normal childhood. We didn't go to worlds of fun or oceans of fun. We went to the planetarium, okay? We went to the arboretum, all right? We didn't do like the big things. We went to the zoo. And we'd go to the zoo for like six days in a row. So we went to the zoo. We, we, we had prepared to go to the zoo by pre-reading material before we went. So 
rather than just going to the zoo and looking at the animals in one day and leaving, we'd go to the bear cage and read that whole placard on the wall next to the bear cage. Talk about bear behavior, do all of that. So growing up as a little kid, I just thought that was normal. I thought that's what you did. I had no idea that it would be more than that. So growing up in that environment with education being so powerful and so much what you do, I was so excited to go to school. So there's that early photograph of me getting ready to go to kindergarten on the kindergarten bus, and I got my little backpack and my short shorts on. And it's the 80s. I'm excited. I'm waving. I'm about to get on the bus. I'm so excited. And that first experience, mom said, if you like this, school is cool. Let's do this. And I said, all right. And we got there that first day, my first day of kindergarten, and that's when I met her. The first love of my life, Mrs. Kissel. Uh, Mrs. Kissel was awesome. The greatest thing about Mrs. Kissel is when you went in Mrs. Kissel's room, there was always activity and motion. There was color. There was things happening. And every time you walked in every day, she was always like, hi, how are you? And she gave you a big old hug. She's so excited to see you. Like, it was awesome. And I loved everything about kindergarten. Because kindergarten was about getting up and moving around and activity and learning. And it was fantastic. And I was like, every school day is like kindergarten. Let's do this. I mean, think about kindergarten. You get it. Take a little rest, you got some milk, all right? You got a snack, all right? You got to learn different things, and it was just so cool. I loved every bit of kindergarten. And so they said, Mom said, listen, if you like kindergarten, it's going to be better. Let's go to first grade. So next year was first grade, and I was pumped to go to first grade. And we walked into first grade. Now, first grade was a little bit of a shift in first grade. Because coming out of this is Kiss's room where everything's fun and active. I went into that. I, you may never have had a classroom like this before. Maybe you have. Uh, I won't tell you this teacher's name. Um, she just struggled sometimes because her classroom was really quiet and it was really cold and it was really formalized in everything we did. And it wasn't the way I did it, it wasn't the way I learned it. So we came in there and all of the desks were in groups of four. And I remember sitting down at my desk and there was tape on the floor and it said, Don't put your hands or arms outside the tape. And I was like, Ugh. This total panic about what was going to happen. And we put all that stuff inside that desk, and we got ready to do the best thing in first grade. And I was so pumped to do the best thing in first grade. I said, let's do this. And she said, are you ready? I said, yeah. And she brought it to us. She said, this is the greatest thing in first grade. And she gave us a spelling list. And we didn't know better. We were like, yeah. All right, spelling. Let's do this. And I got that spelling list. And she said, what am I supposed to do with this? And she said, here's what you do. Take that spelling list home. Memorize those words. And when you come back, on Friday, you'll take a spelling test. Yeah. And if you do really awesome on that spelling test, you'll get a sticker. And what is the best sticker of all stickers? Okay, now I get a variety of answers from the crowd, okay? So we got some gold stars, and you came from poor school, I'm sorry. All right, that's the worst sticker of all stickers, all right? I heard that exactly the right answer is the best sticker is... Scratch and sniff is awesome, all right? Because with scratch and sniff, you blueberry, right? And you can pass it on. <laughs> Coconut. And everybody, so I was so excited because that meant on that Friday, if I did great on that test, it was going to be a sticker. So I went home and I took that list home and I memorized every one of those words. We practiced those words night and day for that whole entire week. And I arrived on that Friday just pumped to take that test. And I slid into my desk, got ready to go, and we sat there, and there were desks in groups of four, and I sat down, and we had those guillotine desks, I don't know if you had those, like, we had to lift the lid to get all your stuff inside, so you had to put your, cut your head off, and so, got all this stuff, and I got out, everything, do you remember they give the littlest people the biggest instruments, like the big red pencil and the huge pad of paper, and we got ready to go, and she said, let's do this list, and so, I was ready to do this, she said, first word, first word is dead. She said, put your wing up so nobody sees you. Nobody's cheating. So now you're skeptical of your neighbor. She's like, what are you looking at? What are you doing? Right? So I took that whole entire list down from what she asked us to do. And I got it done. Have you ever taken a test and you just knew? Like, that was awesome. That was so great. I walked out. And she said, here's what's going to happen. She said, you're going to get in line. You're going to go out to recess. While you're out of recess, I'm going to grade these tests. And when you come back in, if you did well, there'll be a sticker on that test. So I went out there and I played kickball and I was so pumped and I came running back in the room. I slid back in that desk and I looked at that list. And what 
it seemed like forever, she finally came back and she said, what's wrong? And I said, Mrs. X, there's no sticker on my paper. And she said, because there's too much red pen. Too much red pen meant no sticker. I was like, she made too many mistakes. <laughs> and I was just like, what? I can't, what? And I started looking at that paper and it was all marked up. And she had this way of like, she was the classic teacher. She wore the like, the teacher vest with the ruler and the apple and the school bus. She was very kind, but she said no sticker and I was totally panicked. So she said, listen, now here, here's, here's what we can do. You didn't get it this, this week, but next week, take this list home and do this next list and we'll be back next week, you'll pass. I said, okay. So I took that list home and I did it again. And week after week after week, the same thing happened. And it became miserable to go to class on Fridays. Because on Fridays, all it was was a big attention that I was going to fail. And so they started putting up that chart. You know what chart I'm talking about? They put up in the walls of classrooms. It has everybody's name on it. It's a reward chart. And they're like, Susie's really smart. She gets six stickers for passing her test. And then there's Samantha. She's gifted. She's like, 9,000 stickers. <laughs> and then there's my line with my name. And there's a big white blank. And that's where I found myself never achieving that sticker. And they felt bad for me because there was a big bunch of white empty holes. So they wrote GT in it, which meant good try. That's not a sticker. What is that? That's not a sticker. And so you become really easily understood at that point. You start to realize that something was different. Something was going on with me. And what's really sad today is I think that early recognition for a lot of kids happens then. I think a lot of my sped children that I come across already know at that early age something's different with them. And what the challenge is, you feel really smart, but you can't express that. You can't, you can't show that. You can't demonstrate that. And it kills you inside because that chart becomes the thing in the classroom. I've been in classrooms today and I say, well, we don't have that chart. I said, but do you have a set of lists for who's on the red bird list of words and the blue bird list of words and the green list of words? Because if you have that, it's just the same thing. <laughs> Because I can walk into most classrooms today, no matter what age those kids are, and line them up and say, who's the smartest kid in this classroom? They could probably point it out. And I can walk into almost classroom today and say, who's, who's the slowest kid in this room? They could point it out. Who's the athletic one? Who's the wild, crazy, funny one? They can point those out. And very early on, my identity had already formed around the idea that I wasn't passing my spelling tests. And what happens when that happens is, it changed who I was. And I, don't, I didn't recognize it at that time. My parents talk about it with me today. It was so traumatic to have to fail every one of those tests. I do remember coming home day after day on Fridays, running upstairs to the bathroom in our house, which is the only room in our house that my parents allowed to be locked, and jumping in the tub and crying because I had not done it again. All I wanted was a scratch and see mistake. But more than that, I wanted somebody to tell me that I was good at something. I wanted somebody to recognize that I was good at this whatever that was. I didn't know, but I wanted to be recognized. And it was such a challenge for me to do that. And I see today so many kids, I think the one challenge that I face today with special ed kids that when I work with them is they have to say, well, I'm not good at anything. I don't do anything well. This is, this, I can't figure this out. I don't know if I can do this. And what's interesting to me is that oftentimes when you explain, explain a learning disabled child that I work with who comes up to talk to me after a presentation or, or work with me in my school or I work with in a school I go to speak at, they say to me, they say, you know, I, I, I just want to be good at something. I just want to be good at something. And I think there's a universal truth in the fact that everybody ultimately wants to figure out what they're good at in life. And if they can figure that out and find some way that somebody can provide them a reward for that, tell them they're good at it, represent them in front of a group of people as the example of greatness in that thing, and if ultimately in life you can find a way for somebody to pay you to do that, life is good. <laughs> like, that's what it's all about. For a sped kid, that's oftentimes not achievable in the early stages. It's so powerful. And so here I am sitting in this world trying to figure this out. And for me, that was super intense. And so my teachers took me off and said, listen, let's figure out what's up with that. And they took me off to be tested. And I don't know if you've ever been tested for a learning disability, but it is awesome. Because you get out of class to do it, right? You don't have to be there where you fail. And it was great, because they test all kinds of things, like, can you bounce a ball, right? Can you see? Got that under control. Can you hear? You raise your hand, right? You do all those kind of things, which are awesome. And after all of these tests, they kind of came back with my parents and I. They sat us down in a meeting, and they said, Mr. and Mrs. Christensen, and I was sitting in the nurse's office late at night that night on kind of a little partitioned wall between the two of us. 
I was supposed to not hear. And they were on the other side of the little partition wall, and they said, Mr. and Mrs. Christians, and they talked a lot. And I remember they got to a point where it was like a duh, 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 silence. They said, Mr. and Mrs. Christensen, we're sorry, but your son's dyslexic. And I remember riding home in the car, and I started crying, and I was like, I don't want to die. <laughs> I have to leave. I don't want to die. This sounds horrible. And my parents started from that early age explaining to me what it meant to be dyslexic and what it meant, to, what it meant for me and how it was going to work. And oftentimes we, we deal with the concept, and I, I deal with a lot of parents who say, I don't want my kid to be labeled. I don't want my kid to be identified. I don't want my kid to know what's going on. And for me, the most empowering thing for me is that my parents sat me down at that point and said three basic things. One, reading and writing is going to be difficult for you. Two, you're going to have to work harder than everybody else probably. And three, you're going to have to learn for a lot of, ask for, learn for a lot of help. What are you going to do to ask for help? How are you going to do that? And we started the process of learning how to do that. And it was a super intense process for me to go through. And that's something I'm still learning to do today. I'm still learning how to ask for help. I'm still figuring out how much work it takes for me to do something. It's an ongoing process. And so, but what's really important to me, and I think it's really interesting, is I have a lot of people say, well, I, you know, I don't want my kid to be labeled. But if you think about it, if you look at sociology, sociology has this whole idea of this labeling theory, this function. You have a function, right? Under functionalism, you all hold a function. You're a, you're a sister, or you're a brother, or you're a mother, or you're a father, or you're a teacher, or you're something. For me, I'm Matt Christensen, I'm dyslexic. And that empowers me. It doesn't take things away from me. That makes me knowledgeable about what I am, who I am, and how I need to succeed. And that is really, really important. And I think the challenge today we see is we see a lot of kids that I've worked with who have no idea what they are or who they are because they've never been explained what their learning disability is. They've never been explained what their struggle is. And that's really scary. It's kind of like if you went to the doctor's office and you sat in front of the doctor and you said, I think there's something wrong with me. And the doctor came back and we've all been there. We're not sure what's wrong with you. Like, My throat hurts. I got a headache. I feel dizzy. I don't know. This doesn't seem good. And if the doctor came back and said to you, I think you're just in the general sick category. <laughs> and you said, so what are we going to do for general sickness? And they're like, we're going to try a lot of different things. <laughs> Some of them may work and some of them may not. And it's really scary for a special ed kid to have that explanation of what's going to happen. It's really scary to see yourself and not know who you're supposed to be and how it's supposed to work. And for me, that was a really empowering tool to know that I'm dyslexic. I can have that idea today and I can explain to people who I am. And I, what my parents worked on with me, which was really important, was within two minutes I needed to learn how to explain to people who I was, that I needed help, and how I was going to help them help me. And so it started out at a very, very early age, learning to shake someone's hand, look them in the eye, speak clearly and plainly to them, and say, my name's Matt Christensen. I'm in your class. I'm going to need some help. I'm dyslexic. And so the way they taught me, check this out. Do your hands. Take your hands up like this. Class participation. Good job. Take, give me thumbs up like this. Good job. Take your hands, cross them like this. Cross your fingers like this. Very good. Raise your hands up like this. Raise your knuckles up just a little bit. Look at your hands. This is roughly the size of your brain inside of your head. Some of you are like, I have small hands. That's okay. <laughs> the size of your hands does not determine your intelligence. But what's interesting is when I could have that example as a kid and explain to my professors and my teachers, this is what happens to me, that somewhere that bilateralization the idea that the right hand side of my brain controls the left hand side of my body, and the left hand side of my brain controls the right hand side of my body, and that somewhere in there there's a miswiring that causes me to reverse things that I see coming in through my eyes, that come out through my hands when I write. That simple explanation for dyslexia saved me in so many situations. And I find so many kids and I say, so what are you struggling with? And they're like, I don't know. But life is not fun. I don't know, and I need help. And so that first part for me was really identity. That idea of being dyslexic, that idea of being a teacher with dyslexia changes the way I teach in my classroom. It changes the way we work with kids. And what's really interesting is once you have that identity, it doesn't, doesn't make it all better. Because being dyslexic then was a whole challenge of figuring out how to move forward with that identity, what to do next. Because leaving that and working my first day into that special ed classroom, back in the days of the dinosaur days of special education, 
my elementary school days where I was in a mixed room full of all kinds of people with all kinds of issues, with people who really weren't sure exactly what to do to help me or assist me. It was really scary for me. It was scary for them, and we recognized the difference. And so they said, listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to teach you how to be a great person by doing math facts with you. They walked in there, and they held up that big deck of math facts, and they said, you're going to memorize these. And they showed me the first one. It's 4 plus 5. They said, what is it? I said, uh, 9. They said, oh, no, you can't use your hands. What's 4 plus 5? <laughs> 9. <laughs> said, you can't use your toes. It's 4 plus 5. <laughs> no, so you can't do that either. And what's interesting is they, they would sit there hour after hour and help me memorize that deck of cards because they said that's what's most important. But the only problem is I memorize the deck. I'm good at memorization. That's easy. So they got the deck out one day and they held it up to me and went five, seven, two, three. I was going faster than she could flip them. <laughs> She's like, we, we fixed the problem. He's no longer dyslexic. This is awesome. <laughs> I've had all kinds of teachers along the course of time that have handed me stuff. College professors that hand me books and say, if you just read this, you won't be dyslexic anymore. Who say, you're just a bully, you're going to grow out of it. If you just worked harder, it would be easier. It's like, do you know how hard I work? <laughs> These are the challenges and things that I faced. What's really interesting is many people saw me struggle at school, but what they didn't see is me struggling at home. Because a special ed kid in a home is a real challenge. Because when I was identified as having a learning disability and needed help and needed assistance and needed that support for me to be successful at school, I needed support and my parents needed support and my sister needed support. It affects the whole family. Imagine in your head that you're holding in your hand right now a mobile. Children's mobile over the top of their playpen. You grab one of those characteristics and you pull it. What happens to all the other ones? They bounce. They move. They're all out of sort. They all get connected together. And when my life got pulled out of control, everyone else spun too. It makes it harder for everybody else in my household. And that was such a key piece because my sister, who was gifted, Megan, my mom and dad were trying to help me. All of us were stuck in a position to figure out what we could do for Matt. And it was so intense. Every special ed kid has to have a community around the outside of them to be successful. It has to happen. And if that community is in the school with the paraprofessional or the special ed teacher or the OT person or whatever it is, that individual who's working with child psychologist, whatever that is, there's also a need for that in the house, in the home, for those families that are struggling. Because you may only see me as a teacher, as a kid sitting in your room. What you don't know is that I came home last night because there were 30 math problems assigned, and I sat and worked for four hours, what felt like four hours to me, which is probably an hour to try and do those math problems. Writing and erasing and writing and erasing and writing and erasing and trying to get it done. And what you thought took a little bit of time caused my family to spin because they're like, somebody's gotta help Matt. And while somebody was helping Matt, somebody wasn't helping Megan, my sister. And when somebody was helping Matt, the dinner wasn't getting done. And so that learning disability affected everything about who I am, and it still does today. I have to choose the way I do things based on knowing that I have learning disability. I have to go into job interviews, and when they ask you, is there any assistance you're going to need, I have to say, clearly in that job interview, I guess I could hide it. But I'm willing to say, I have a disability, I'm dyslexic, I'm going to need help and support when it comes to working and sending stuff out over email. And I know that in the past, it has hurt me in interviews and job opportunities compared to other candidates who can do it faster and more able than I could. This learning disability affects so much more than what's in your classroom. It affects my, my opportunities in the field, in play. I play sports, and there's nothing worse than running the play the wrong way. <laughs> I tried to do band, and there's nothing worse than doing band and counting out those rhythms and trying to watch those marks on the paper not move and start your symbol early at the music festival and ruin the band's chances. We listened to the tape of the judges at the end, and the judge said, symbol's too early, deduction of two points. I knew that was me. A lot of my life is facing that challenge of things that go well and things that go poorly. And it's all about how do we work with a community of people to lead to success? How do we all gain together to make that happen? And it's a challenge. So I found myself in this small town in rural Iowa trying to figure out how to move forward. And from those experiences, what I really learned was the importance of working with other people, moving forward in these ideas. And as I did it, what I found is people saw me as a kid who was supposed to achieve certain things at certain rates. Certain marks. By first grade, you should be able to do this. 
by second grade, you should be able to do this. And when I didn't accomplish that, they're like, I don't know. I don't know. We've stopped sometimes. We know so much about how kids learn, and we sometimes forget that kids are on a continuum of learning. They don't learn in preset steps, but instead they learn over the course of time. And that goes away because we're asked oftentimes as professionals, as teachers, to, to recount on an exam or a test or some kind of standardized test where, what quartile are they in? But we rarely look at them as individuals. And we rarely show those individuals growth over time. You know what would have been really powerful for me is to sit in a meeting with the teacher and rather than them say, you didn't reach the benchmark, didn't make it, Matt. The rest of the class is on the bluebird list, but you're still on green, verging backward and backing into red. What was really powerful is I had a teacher one time who said, rather than looking where you should be, let's look how far you came. Let's look at what you've done. Let's celebrate your successes. You know, when I took chemistry in high school, which was a terrible choice, I don't know if you know this, but chemistry is totally made up. <laughs> in my world, chemistry is made to punish people. That's, I don't understand it. It's the Joker to my Batman. It was my struggle here at K-State. It was awful. I did chemistry in high school, and to celebrate a, get this, a D in chemistry. My mom baked me a cake. We celebrate as a family a dean. While most families would say, man, you just didn't try hard enough, or oh, you didn't do enough. That cake was the best cake I ever ate. It was fantastic. And too often times, I find myself working with students who say, well, I didn't achieve the A. Then I'm a failure. And I oftentimes say, but look at how far you came. Look at how much you've done. Look at where you've been and where you are now. And that's a key piece of how I see myself today, because a lot of what I do is struggle and fail and struggle and fail and struggle and fail. But that idea of a growth mindset, well, okay, where am I going, what am I going to do, and how am I going to do it is so important to me. And so moving through these steps and stages has been such a struggle to me that I found myself deciding I wanted to be popular. I wanted to be cool. So I found myself trying to do sports. Tough choice. I wanted to be cool. And I'm standing in my locker one day, and this voice out of the side of my ear says, Hi, what's your name? I was like, Oh no, it's a girl. She's talking to me. I started to sweat. And she said, Come on, what's your name? You must be new here. And I was like, Oh no. Everything I do, I worry people can see my dyslexia. I worry people can see me being dyslexic. It's a challenge. I think about it all the time. And I was standing there turning that locker, and I never got that locker combination open because it's being dyslexic. It's left and right. And while dyslexia oftentimes affects the writing, I'm also dysnomic, which means the reversal of numbers. So 45 can look like a 54, and 23 can look like a 32. I'm standing there trying to turn that knob and open that locker, and I, hand, I can never get that thing open. What do, you, what do you do when you're a kid that can't open a locker in school? You become that kid with a gigantic book bag. Have you seen that kid, right? You're like, Quasimodo carrying that massive 5,000 pound backpack up that hill every day with like shoes falling out of it and papers falling out of it because I wanted to look like everybody else, which meant keep your stuff with you all the time. Because if you open that locker, what happens? Do you put your stuff in it? Because you put your stuff in it, show you go to class, the teacher says, Where's your stuff? You say, uh, No. Just get it. Nope. <laughs> Then you have to get the janitor, they have to open the locker, it starts all over again. And that was the challenge for me. Everything was tough. And so I was standing one day at that locker, I was turning that knob, and I hear this voice out of my head, and it says, Hi, what's your name? You must be new here. Again and again and again. So finally I looked at her. I turned to look at her. It was the most beautiful girl in the whole class. And she was looking at me. And she said, Hi, you must be new here. I said, Yes. <laughs> yes! And she said, what's your name? I said, Matt! And it came out way too loud. <laughs> it's on the head, I'm like, be cool, man. Be cool, don't be dyslexic. Like, All right. Matt, yeah, Matt. And she said, hey, Matt, um, that's awesome. Do you do any activities here? And I nodded through it. Have you ever said something you were like, no? <laughs> I let that go, and she said, that's great, what do you do? I've never done an activity because my challenge was succeeding in life. You see, what I did is they recognized very early on that I was going to struggle and they put me in a sped room. And every day I did those math facts over and over and over again. And 
And as I struggled to do those math facts over and over and over again, I was trying to figure out how to make this work. I wasn't playing baseball and softball or soccer in the summer. I was doing math, reading, and writing. I wasn't doing activities with my friends. I was doing reading, writing, and math. Trying to catch up with stuff that I missed at school all the time. And when I went to school, I was memorizing, memorizing the cards. And so I said, I don't, I don't know. She said, what activities do you do? I said, I don't know. She said, do you play? She started to list them off. Do you play baseball? I changed directions. Nope, nope, nope. She said, do you play basketball? Nope, nope, nope. Do you do? And she kept water polo. And I was like, how do they put horses in the pool? I was from Iowa. <laughs> what? No, no. She said, are you a thespian? And I was like, I don't even know what that is. I, what are we doing here? This is cool. We didn't have thespians in Iowa. We just had like theater. We didn't have names for people. It was really simple. We, didn't, we had wrestling and basketball. And it was very basic. And so all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? And I knew I needed an activity. She said, do you play football? And I said, yes. <laughs> I've never played football in my entire life. <laughs> and so that led me to show up at that tryout meeting. And I showed up at that tryout meeting and I walked in there that day, late for the tryout of the team. And I asked, how is this going to work? And he said, well, it's going to happen. Coach said you showed up a little bit late. So you gotta take one of these pamphlets and fill it out. Go try out and figure out what position you have. I didn't know what to do. So I said, Coach, I don't know what to do. And he said, Well, instead you can go to summer to a bunch of camps and figure it out. I said, Let's do this. So I went to a different camp every day that summer to figure out how to play football. I showed up at Nebraska University trying to be a quarterback. I walked on the field and handed me a ball and said, throw it. <laughs> yeah. like, special ed. They recognized I didn't know what I was doing. They recognized I was struggling. We went to Northern Oklahoma the next week to be an to be a wide receiver. I don't know if you can look at me, but I don't look like a wide receiver. I'm not fast. I'm not wiry. I don't have hands. I usually back things away from me rather than catch them. It's a challenge of how to do this. I went through that and showed up that next fall after that summer of work tried out for that football team and walked on there. What I wanted more than anything else was to be recognized for being good at something. If I can't do it in school, it's got to be on the field. If I can't do it, it's got to be here. This is my chance to get the girl to do the activity, and I took part in that football tryout, and I was amazing. <laughs> I've been out summer, all summer, playing football. I look like a bronze god. <laughs> Catching balls, running plays, and I went through that trial, and you can see the coach was like, hey, it was number 50. And I went to get that trial list, and they had the freshman list, and the sophomore list, and the JV list, and the varsity list, and I looked, my name wasn't going to be on the freshman list. So I looked at the sophomore list, and I, uh. You get used to failing as a spectator. I just expected that I failed, and my buddy Justin Swift tapped my shoulder, and he goes, whoa, 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 You start JV Thursday night. Varsity Friday. <laughs> yes, I do. I was so excited. I got that jersey. I wore it around that school for the next week with so much pride. Look at this guy, number 50. I'm going to be awesome. And I tried out for that team, and I made it. And it was the greatest experience ever. I was going to take the girl. Everything was awesome. We went to that first game, Bonner Springs, Kansas. It's like 1,000 degrees outside. <laughs> so hot when animals got outside. I'm just like, <laughs> burst into flames. <laughs> I went out there that first game. And I had not prepared. My whole entire life has to be about, pre prepar about pre preparation in my group that supports me. I walked out there for that first game, and I did the warm-up. And after the warm-up, they took us into the shed in Bonner Springs, Kansas, the steel shed to do the code of the meeting with all the team. And I sat down there, it's like 1,000 degrees, and we're sweating. And the coach goes, all right, gentlemen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to run a 32, and we're going to run a 23 pass. Odds go to the right, evens go to the left. Any questions? We're going to run a 45 run and a 54 run. Questions? No, I'm dyslexic. Left and right. I'm just knowing like 32, 23. It's a trip. How am I going to do this? I panicked. I ran to the trainer's bag, grabbed a heavy black marker, wrote all the odd plays on one arm, all the even plays on the other arm, put my equipment back on, and I ran back in line. My buddy goes, hey. And you get the plates in your arm, I'm going to see which way you're running, you've got to cover those up. So I ran and I grabbed a heavy black marker from the trainer's bag, and I went and I get a heavy hill sweatshirt and I covered it up and I tried to cross it out and I got out and I got on that field, it's a thousand degrees outside. We get out there and I'm sweating like a madman. We get in the first huddle and if I stay calm, I'm not dyslexic. But 
when I get amped up, I get more dyslexic. I know that about myself because I know that I'm a dyslexic and I know that if I get nervous and I need people to help me around the outside of me and I'm not prepared. I got in that huddle, it was a thousand degrees, I got set, quarterback called the play, it's a 32, a 32 on two, running break. I got up on that line and I go to pull up those sleeves to see which way I'm running. I made a terrible mistake. I wanted to pull up those sleeves, all the numbers went, because <laughs> I didn't sweat. And I pulled up this arm, all the numbers went, <laughs> I was like, what? I got back down and I went. And all of a sudden it went really fast, it was windy outside. And all of a sudden the coach goes, Christian, what a what a what a what I was like, yes. I don't know if you know this. Take your hands, do it like this, please. Look at you. Put this over here like this. We're going to come on right here and you can't hear anything when you got a helmet on. It's windy outside. And I got a helmet on and the coach goes, Christian, he says again, what a what a what a what I'm like, okay. I get back in that play, I get back in that huddle, and I say, all right, it's a 45, it's a 45, on two, on two, ready, break. This time I'm like, it's odd, it's got to go to the right. And just as I go to get set, the linebacker sneaks up my gap and he goes, number 50, I'm going to eat your spleen. I'm like, how's it going to get my spleen? What's it going to taste like? I'm not being calm. I can't control my dyslexia. It goes out of whack. I run the wrong way. I run into somebody, I fall down, the coach goes, Christensen, what a, what a, what a, what He goes, Christensen, what a, what a, what a, what a. I ran over that sidelines and I was like, he's giving me a break, I'm awesome. <laughs> I ran past all of my fellow friends who hand I mean, gave me a high five and I walked right up to the coach and I walked past the cheerleaders and I'm like, hey, and I was like, there's the girl from the hall. I walked up and he grabbed me and he popped my helmet off. He said, Christensen, we've been working on these plays for like four weeks and you went out there and messed it up for everybody. Come on! If you're not man enough to play this game, get off my field. something so bad, before you went to do it, you said, let this one be mine. In that moment, I lost it. He held my hand, handed me my helmet, and I went over and I sat down on the sidelines. It never stopped being selective. It never goes away. And that day, I recognized that I had to be a dyslexic football player. I tried out, tried to play better in the next couple weeks and it didn't go very well. I got cut from the JV back down to the sophomore and then they kind of kept me on the sidelines. I didn't play very much. That next fall, I tried out to get to show that I was man, man enough to play the game. And then I approached my five best friends, sat down at the table and said, I can't play football anymore. My grades are in the hole and I'm not doing it well and I can't do this anymore. Three of them got up on the table and said, then I can't be your friend very much. So now it's called boys stuff. Three got up and left me who, who became my best friend in high school. I graduated from Blue Dot High with like a 3.0. It was a lot of work to get to that. Nobody gave me an accolade. I never wore a cord at graduation. I never was recognized for having achieved any kind of special award, but I graduated. And for me, that was a big to Johnson County Community College and ended up here at K-State. And my life has changed because I had a teacher in high school in the name of Charlotte Walker who spent time to make me understand that a special ed classroom is not a place where you go just to do homework. It's not a place where they just drag you out of class and you start to fail. It's a place where they bring you and they teach you strategies. And the power of that classroom was all the stuff I've just talked about, having an identity, being proud of who you are, and learning how you need to learn, being supported in that, was all done in that classroom. And I found myself with other kids who had learning disabilities who had the same things I had happening to me. And the power of being in that sped classroom is I could say to people, do you have this teacher, do they treat you that way? And they're like, yes. And it's like, how do you overcome that? And we talk about the homework we thought was hard and say, hey, how do you do that? And having that community of people in that special ed classroom was so important to me. It was so positive to me because I believed that being dyslexic was not a bad thing and I believed working with these people would help teach me how to be a better dyslexic. I didn't always want to do what they asked me to do. What's interesting is I didn't do my homework in there. What they did in that room is they taught me learning strategies. They taught me the KU learning strategies. I learned pirates, I learned morphographs, I learned uh, note-taking strategies, I learned all kinds of strategies that I still use today. When I take a test today, I still use pirates. When I write notes today, I still use my note-taking strategy. I use morphographs every day when I try to spell. It's how I do it. 
that's been a lifelong thing for me, and I learned it in that room. It was only you could use your homework if you used the strategy on it. So I would go back into the regular classroom, was empowered, provided something to make me more successful as a student. And if you want to provide a level playing field for a special ed kid, that is one of the most powerful ways to do it. Giving those skills to them to help them understand who they are, how they learn, and then take that knowledge and apply it to that makes a better kid. But oftentimes see kids that are left mainstreamed all day long who don't know anybody else in the room who's that, unless they have a parent sitting next to them. And they never have that community, and that makes me sad. Because that community is so important to me. I keep in touch with more of the people in that classroom than I do the people in my actual class in 1994. I still keep in touch with Tiffany, who's one of the only few girls I knew who was dyslexic. That's empowering to me. I graduated from Blue Valley with those basic skills and came to K-State. And I worked really, really hard at K-State. While most people came to college to like party and have a great time, I came to school and spent a lot of it in the library in the quiet area setting, or government documents is awful and quiet and boring. Why? Because no one ever goes there. <laughs> so you can sit and study quietly. And I accessed the opportunity to get the resources here at K-State because right before I left, they reevaluated my IEP and figured out which modifications helped me learn, which ones didn't. And I worked really hard to make sure that I was using those and prepping myself to get services here at K-State. And I walked out on this campus, I met Andrea Blair, and I worked through how to help me learn at K-State. And I received extra time, extra notes, and I would have professors say, where do you go to take those tests? I said, let's show you. I invited, to my, invited my econ teacher over, I said, come check out this room. He's like, what happens in there? And I was like, that's where we take tests. <laughs> He's like, how do you do it? I showed him the room with the glass, and how I'm in a little cubicle, and how I use my note-taking, spell-taking Franklin to talk back. Because he wanted everything spelled perfect, and if I typed into Franklin, it would say it out loud, and I could tell. Because I can't tell the difference between was and saw sometimes. And every time I write first, every time I write first, it turns out to be first. Can't stop it. It's like a tag. It just pops out. <laughs> the funny thing today is the reason I'm successful is because the community around that side of me. I figured out that on that first night trying to prepare for a and that first big class I took, I sat down in that first big class at K-State next to a girl who was wearing a set of letters on her sweatshirt. And I said to her, what are those? And she said, well, I'm Greek. I said, hey, I'm Matt, I'm German, it's nice to meet you. <laughs> and I, she said, no, 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 I'm in a sorority. I said, what's a sorority? She said, a sorority is a whole house full of girls that live and work together. And I was like, that's awesome, where do they put these? <laughs> and she said, well, they're kind of spread throughout campus. And I said, hey, can I come hang out with you guys? And she's like, well, I don't know, that's how that works sometimes, maybe. <laughs> And so that first night before that first big test, I was panicked for that first psych test, and I found my way up to one of those houses that had those letters on the door. I knocked on the door, and I went inside, and I used that strategy. My parents stopped me. Hey, I'm Matt. How's it going? I'm dyslexic, and I need some help, and I think there's a girl here who's in my class who lives in this house, and I just, she said she could help me. And she was like, well, what's her name? And I said, that's the problem. See, I forgot her name. <laughs> I know she's Greek, though. <laughs> I'm German. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> and through that experience, he said, well, how can you describe her? And she, I said, she's kind of a medium tall. <laughs> and he said, what's her color hair? I couldn't remember. It's kind of blondish, brownish, reddish. Depends on the light. <laughs> I said, can you just make an announcement for the most beautiful girl to come downstairs? <laughs> she said, no, I can't do that. <laughs> I said, come on. I said, she'll know who she is. She's beautiful. She's funny. She's fun. She's amazing. Bring her here. She said, I can't do that to make this announcement over this intercom for her to come downstairs. I said, just say that. Beautiful, funny, fun, kind, she'll come. <laughs> and she said no, so I just sat down in a little waiting area and just waited. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the woman got tired and she's like, okay, I'll make the announcement. So she made the announcement, the most beautiful, funny, fun guy. 5,000 girls. <laughs> <laughs> and they were all there to try and figure out what was going on, and I looked at all of them, and none of them were my girl. And I thought to myself, ugh. I started to leave, and I consider myself kind of the Jamie Bond of dyslexics. <laughs> you gotta learn how to ask for help. You gotta be sneaky sometimes. So I turned to him, I said, well, I hope I don't fail this test. <laughs> and I hope, I, I hope my parents don't, you know, kick me out of college. They can come home. 
And one girl raised her hand, she said, I'm the president of this house. Who in here is taking psychology? And like 12 hands went up. She said, you, you students take him in that room with the weird one with the piano. And you study. You help him. And I went in that room and I sat down and they helped me do psychology. On Monday night at the Alpha Zeons. On Tuesday nights, I snuck up the street around the other way to the cafes and did my math. <laughs> and on Wednesday night, I went to the Thetas and asked for help in my econ. And every night, I studied with a different group of my sorority sisters. <laughs> and sorority sisters have fraternity boyfriends who keep copies of old tests. <laughs> and you can work with them. And all of a sudden, I became more than just a single, struggling, learning disabled student in K-State. I became a member of a community of people who would help me learn how to learn. And I took all the knowledge I had, all those strategies I learned as a sped kid. See, that's the amazing thing about sped kids, is everything they teach a sped kid is really helpful for regular people, too. <laughs> I took all those strategies and I applied them to those individuals, and I did all of that work, and by the end of that time, with all those girls and all those guys, I was teaching them history, and they were teaching me calculus and chemistry and everything else. What was really amazing is I started passing my classes and doing well. It's a lot of hard work. I took a lot of hard classes. And I found myself working longer nights, and I found them become more efficient rather than working hard. There's a difference between working hard and working efficiently. It took me a while to figure that out. If you could teach a sped kid the idea is working smart, not working hard. Because a sped kid, you can work really hard for a really long time. It doesn't produce anything. You can work smart for a length of time and accomplish more than working hard. And I figured that out at case day. And when I needed help, I went to Andrea. When I needed help with my reading and writing and my stuff, I went to my friends. My fraternity stories and sisters and brothers and sisters. And I worked over stuff. I had to write a big, huge paper before I left for the College um, of Art and Sciences for History. Big, massive paper at the end. It's a massive paper. It's huge in the history department. They said, you got to write one, and they picked the professor, and the professor picked my topic, and said, nuclear proliferation in the 1950s, and I thought, awesome. So I got that paper, topic, and I started researching. And what I had to do is I had to write that paper, then send it off to them, and have them edit it and get it back, and then, and then I'd have to get my sorority sisters to look at it. And they'd edit it, and I'd edit it, and I'd send it to my parents for editing, just for the reading and writing. So the one thing you have to understand is if you're a sped kid, You'll work harder, typically, more than anybody else. You'll put yourself in positions sometimes. You'll see kids in classrooms and people who are special ed put themselves in positions where they know they might struggle and fail because you just want to be like everybody else. I never, ever wanted anybody to change my content. I just wanted people to help me spell. I have it in here. I just can't relate it to you. It's so powerfully frustrating to know you're smart and not be able to represent that to others. And what's really weird to me is that a lot of sped kids don't understand, and we used to use the discrepancy clause, and it still plays in a factor today. I talk about it with my son, the idea that you're really high-level intelligence but a really low-level performance. That really kind of describes a learning disability. But I have a lot of students that I work with all the time when I give these speeches that have no idea that they are actually really smart. I think they know in their hearts, but they've covered it up with so much pain and frustration. So when I sit down with a kid and I say, did you know that you're super smart? The only reason you've got an IV or you're in this bedroom is because you're super smart and they don't bring dumb people here. And I'm like, yeah, it's not really dumb people. It's one of the really smart people. We just need to teach them how to learn. I went and wrote that paper. It took me a whole entire semester to do it. I wrote that paper, and as I wrote that paper, I got down to the last night before I had to turn it in. I don't know if you've been writing a paper at like 3 o'clock in the morning and you're losing your mind. Like, you have no idea what you're doing anymore, you're getting tired. And I went to spell check that paper, and I messed it up. When I messed it up, I clicked change all rather than change. And changed one word throughout the whole entire paper. I took nuclear and made it unclear. I printed it, and I couldn't see the mistake. I took it, and I handed it in. I waited two weeks, and I went back to pick up my paper. can't spell, you can't graduate. I wrote a second paper. I spent an extra semester at K-State after my student teaching to write a second one to make it worthwhile. If you show a special ed kid that you're willing to put the time and effort in, which that professor did, said, I'll help you, let's figure out how to do this right. And I went back through and I rewrote a really good paper and 
I spelled it correctly. I'll work harder than anybody else if I believe that you care. I wrote that second paper and I prepared to graduate from K-State. And today I hold a degree from K-State University which hangs on my wall in my classroom. It's one of the most proud things I have. I didn't take it down today because it needs to stay there. It needs to stay there because every kid who walks in that room has to see it when they walk past it behind my desk. Because they need to know that every sped kid, which I tell my classes about this time of year that I have a learning disability, every sped kid can earn one of those. What's interesting today is we find ourselves in a society where we have lost a lot of the basic ideals of education for the fear of having to make sure that everybody achieves at a certain rate. We've lost that idea of kids learning on a continuum at times. We've lost track of the fact that kids can learn strategies that can help them be incredibly successful. We sometimes get caught up in the newest and latest things and forget how to do it. We forget what it feels like to struggle at home and in your school. And the challenge of that is that I find myself having a problem because I face the challenge of this. This is why we've had this talk today. Again. This is Will Christensen. Will Christensen is seven. Will Christensen, two weeks ago, was diagnosed as dyslexic. I spent $5,000 getting Will Christensen diagnosed as dyslexic. Will Christensen's lucky that his parents made enough money to pay for that. There's a bunch of kids today in the United States that don't have that money to be able to go to Children's Mercy and have them pay for that. Will Christensen was lucky his parents could take off four separate days to go do the testing. Will Christensen's really lucky that he attends a Blue Valley school who's willing to meet with us on Thursday, tomorrow, to figure out what Will Christensen's IEP will be and what accommodations have to be given to him. But Will Christensen's year this year has been really hard. Will Christensen's has struggled figuring out who he is, what he's good at, and who the community of people will who will help him be successful. What makes me sad is my dad's dyslexic. He struggled, but he's a veterinarian. I'm a dyslexic, but I'm a teacher. And I hope Will Christensen becomes even more than I was. I am. I hope Will Christensen gets that support. I hope Will Christensen's teachers see him as an important person. I hope Will Christensen's teachers see him as somebody who can succeed, rather than just a boy who's just probably a little rowdy, rather than just a seven-year-old who should make some reversals, rather than as an individual who's not meeting his math score. Rather than an individual who's not succeeding in first grade. And his behaviors aren't always great. He struggles. And sometimes his behaviors, which are a symptom of his disability, become more important for people sometimes than his disability. He acts out. He struggles. Impulsive talk. He begs for people to pay attention to him and what he knows. Because he wants people to know how smart he is. And it's hard as a parent to hear those things come home and know that that's also who he so when you sit in a conversation someday with a learning disabled parent, or a kid, and you can probably recognize across the table that probably one of those parents struggled as well. But I appreciate you coming today because that shows that you want to know how to help Will Christensen. I can tell you this, this kid loves Legos. This kid loves animals. And this kid loves to learn when he doesn't have to go to school. And I'm going to put all my time and all my energy in to make sure that Will Christensen loves school. I need you to help me. Because when you leave here, he might be in one of your classrooms someday. And I need you to be a knowledgeable, competent, caring individual who can make Will Christensen a success.